Thank you, Teresa. Um, it's now time to start today's more formal presentations, and I'm delighted to introduce and welcome the Minister assisting the Minister for Broadband Communications and the Digital Economy on the Digital Economy, Senator the Honourable Kate Lundy. Minister. Uh, thank you uh, to Johanna Plant, Chair of ACAN, Teresa Corbin, CEO, to Axel Leblois, President and Executive Director of the G3 ICT, Karen Pelt Strauss from the US FCC, to Jill Risley uh, to Telstra, from Telstra, but also can I acknowledge other sponsors supporting uh, this fantastic um, inaugural M enabling con conference. I'd also like to welcome other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and to pay my respects to Elder Uncle Chika of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation uh, and past elders, and uh, thank him for his wonderful warm welcome to country this morning. There's no doubt that mobile technology is spreading throughout the Australian community, and we are a country, traditionally, of early adopters. In June of 2012, 8.67 million Australians aged 18 and over had a smartphone, a percentage change of 104 per cent since 2011. And many of those people don't just use one device. 3.6 million of them use two, a smartphone and a tablet, to access the internet. Mobile broadband traffic is expected to grow strongly. Between 2011 and 2016, we're expecting a 14-fold increase. Mobile technology is increasing capital productivity, with estimated economic productivity benefits of over $11.8 billion over the next decade. Ladies and gentlemen, the widespread adoption of mobile technology is creating opportunities for everybody, everywhere. These opportunities are driven by consumers increasingly using online services, which in turn has resulted in a higher data usage and community awareness, resulting in demand for yet greater capacity, including the 4G network upgrades. We know there are 17.4 million subscribers with internet access connections via a mobile handset in Australia, an increase of 7% in just the last six months. This mobile technology can also assist people with disabilities or communication impairments who can take advantage of smartphone features to assist with communications, either by using the built-in features like SMS, voice recognition, or um, translation services. For example, an app such as Georgie on Android allows, the blind, uh, allows blind people to navigate day-to-day -day tasks such as catching a bus, knowing their whereabouts and reading printed text. Other apps such as Walkie Talkie use Google Navigation to provide step-by-step -step directions while reading aloud addresses, business names and landmarks. A similar app also speaks the names of a user's surroundings. Our CSIRO is trialling an app that aims to allow the elderly to live at home safely for longer by collecting data on their movements around the house. This Smarter, Safer Home project is currently being trialled in New South Wales. While data is collected by motion sensors, the data is also reported to a tablet device so the elderly person can retain control over what data gets reported. Vision Australia provides accessibility orientations via podcast on smartphone and tablets for people with impaired vision. A number of Queensland special schools are using tablets as learning tools for their students. Darling Point Special School uses iPads in English, maths and science classes and have found it's helped children communicate far better. Also in Queensland, 
uh, people, and I, I'd like to um, use Jocelyn Bartlam as an example, have found using a tablet after a spinal injury is assisting uh, dramatically in her rehabilitation as well as helping her stay in touch with friends. While these opportunities are great with people living with a disability or communications impairment, we also need to bear in mind the digital divide that ex presently exists in Australia. While smartphone usage for those aged 13 to 34 was 80, sorry, 74%, the figure is only 15% for people for age 65 and over. And smartphone users are more likely to be, on, to be higher income earners and live in metropolitan areas. So our capacity to have mobile access to data services is limited uh, for some people and guided in some respects by where they live. In relation to fixed online services, a service access, the government's objective with the National Broadband Network is to make high bandwidth services available to every Australian. With the government's National Broadband Network, there is no charge to have the businesses or homes uh, physically connected to the network, to the fibre, and the guaranteed upload speeds give them the ability to use fully interactive services at high resolutions. The government's MBN treats regional Australians as equals, with a universal price guarantee built in. This means that people pay the same wholesale price for the same broadband service, whether they live in Dubbo or the middle of Sydney. We are investing $30.4 billion on a network that will be able to deliver 1,000 megabits per second. With an upload speed of 400 megabits per second, a network that can be easily upgraded, sorry, with an upload speed of 400 megabits per second, and this is a network that can be easily upgraded in the future. Of course, fixed and mobile connectivity are not alternatives, they are complementary. The high bandwidth national broadband network will make it easier for businesses and communities to develop Wi-Fi hotspots and take the heavy lifting load of broadband wireless networks so they are available for the mobile services they are designed for. The national broadband network will accelerate the rapidly growing use of hotspots for those without access to mobile broadband. In the June 2012 quarter, over 2 million Australians used a Wi-Fi hotspot, up 32% on the previous year. The infrastructure is one thing, but bring, bridging the digital divide also means helping people understand what they can do with the internet and how to use the necessary tools. Beyond mere consumption of online services, our aim must be to help people with communication challenges to participate fully in a digitally enabled democracy. This means having the tools, the skills and the confidence necessary to create their own online spaces and to influence the direction of affairs as much as anybody else. The Rudd Labor government's updated national digital economy strategy aims to build Australians' capacity to make the most from the potential offered by that infrastructure. Under this initiative, the Australian government is providing $13.6 million in grant funding to establish a digital hubs program designed to help communities gain the skills needed to maximise the benefits offered by high bandwidth networks. The digital hubs program is currently available in 40 communities around Australia. A key target group is seniors with limited experience with ICTs. Another angle of attack against the digital divide is the government's Digital First initiative. This policy commits Australian government agencies to using digital channels as their primary or preferred form of service delivery. This puts major services online, increasing accessibility and reducing the costs. The policy is part of a broader government goal to have 80% of Australians choose to interact with the government online by the year 2020. Agencies must design digital service, services in accordance with three core principles. 
Agencies will design online services for the end user so that they are convenient, secure and of course accessible. Agencies will use the move to digital first to re redesign their business process, reviewing the relevant policies and processes as well as legislation where necessary. Agencies will design their services for integration with agencies collaborating on common standards, portals and credentials to give users easy and consistent navigation. All priority government services will be part of Digital First, including services that relate to welfare, child support, health and aged care services. And they'll be working to make these services available online as soon as possible, including planning all services in accordance with Digital First from January 2014. So this conference could not have come at a better time. This will mean agencies will be planning their services to be end-to-end -end digital, from initial enrolment to identity verification to subsequent translations, and making these services available on a range of devices, computers, tablets, mobile phones, where appropriate. And where face-to-face -face services are still required, as of course they will be, agencies will also make video available as an alternative wherever cost is effective and consistent with government policy and accessibility principles. A great example of mobile government service delivery is the Express Plus suite of mobile apps produced by the Department of Human Services. These applications allow Australians to access a variety of services via their mobile phone or tablet. With DHS claiming to be the Australia's largest civilian government agency. According to them, their mobile apps are 69% more effective at helping people find the services they need compared to the alternative online interface. DHS estimate the apps have saved 200,000 hours of network processing time since the launch back in 2012 something like or close to and the figure I have here is nine nine hundred and seventy five thousand apps have been downloaded. Fifteen million translations uh, sorry transactions processed and one hundred thousand customers report every fortnight using Express Plus. DHS, which is the Department of Human Services um, their apps also allow people to use their smartphone camera to scan information about their claims rather than having to mail proof. Daily uploads of document photos from the apps reportedly exceed 1,300 in June of this year. In addition, the Express Plus Lite app from DHS is currently available in Vietnamese, Chinese and Arabic allowing job seekers who speak these languages to record and report their earnings using their smartphone. Internet and mobile technologies are also having an impact on the National Relay Service, a telephone access service available to all Australians, I'm sure you're very familiar with. It assists people who have a hearing or speech impairment or are deaf to contact anyone in the wider telephone network. Anyone in the community can use it to communicate with those who are deaf or have a hearing or speech impairment. And the NRS has taken advantage of new technology to assist people uh, to access new technologies. As from July the 1st this year, the new NRS services available include a video relay service that enables deaf Australians to communicate using Auslan, an SMS relay service that enables deaf, hearing and speech impaired Australians to send an SMS from a standard mobile telephone through the NRS to another party. And further service improvements are to be progressively delivered in the second half of 2013. And these include improvements to internet relay that will allow NRS users to receive as well as make phone calls on internet enabled devices 
a web-based captioned telephony service that will allow Australians with hearing impairments to read other person's responses in phone conversations in close to real time, and access to a range of existing and future NRS service options through a mobile app. I believe the convergence of the NRS and online technologies provides uh, a new platform of inclusiveness uh, for those with speech or hearing impairments. Ladies and gentlemen, we clearly face a number of challenges if those with the communication challenges and disabilities are to participate fully as citizens in a digital world. In particular, some of the people who be potentially benefit most from mobile technologies are the ones who currently use it least, um, confronted with perhaps barriers or socioeconomic reasons for not doing so. It's the promise of democratisation of data, of information, be it from the digitisation of Australia's cultural assets through to you managing your personally controlled e-health record. Um, it's a, a rare fact that here in Australia it is the universality of the national broadband network that will make the potential of this democratisation of information reach reality. The opportunities are enormous and are still unfolding and this conference could not have come at a better time to help guide government policy to provide us with the practical and pragmatic advice that ACAN has a strong history and proud record of doing. As we proceed down the pathway to becoming the most connected nation on earth and closing our digital divide through active, our active commitment to the national broadband network. I'm a very proud member of the Rudd Labor government that is promoting these policies. I know this conference will make a very positive contribution to the conversation we have before us. And I would like to wish each and every one of you all the best over the next couple of days. I would like to congratulate the organisers once again. We can only achieve what we aspire to achieve as a government, a fair society full of opportunity if we get quality advice from organisations and conferences such as this on what the path looks like to get there. I would like to finish by just letting you know that all of the links to um, the initiatives that I've described in my speech uh, will be available on my website and I'll be making a particular effort to ensure that it is as accessible as I can possibly make it. Thank you so much for listening this morning. Have a great couple of days. Thank you, Minister. Uh, can I ask you... I'll start now. Thank you. Can I just ask you if you'd be prepared to stay at the lectern for a few minutes and take some questions? Certainly. Thank you. So, you have a very small opportunity, the audience, to ask the Minister a few questions, maybe one or two, or maybe even three, but please remember to wait for the microphone before you do. So, is there anyone that would like to ask a question? Hello. Yeah, Senator, uh, thank you for your, uh, your speech. Just a question to do with, it's a technical one in a sense. We are used to having unicasting, which is the main form of broadband for mobile devices. But in rural Australia, where we're still on satellite, um, we actually need multicasting. We need all our providers to develop, uh, to implement multicasting because even if we take on all on board all the things we've spoken about here today, if we're using satellite in rural areas, it's about making sure that people with disabilities in rural areas can still access all those services and we need multicasting on the satellite. So if we can take that on board, that'd be marvellous. Uh, look, I certainly will. Um, as many of you would know, part of the National Broadband Network plan is that there will be a percentage of Australians serviced via satellite. 
to make sure we get that universal coverage. Uh, so I will certainly um, follow that up and, and make sure that we can get an answer for you. Thank you, Minister. And we've got a question just in front of the gentleman that asked the question. Uh, th thank you. It's Susan Thompson, um, an advocacy advisor at Vision Australia. I'm interested um, to just throw an idea out there, and that's one that um, I understand under government, pol under government sort of processes that there are uh, licences, for example, for companies to be able to retail in Australia, and perhaps a, a thought that perhaps the license that licensing system should have built into it uh, a requirement that if they have a retail licence to retail in Australia, there are some accessibility mandates, such that things like mobile phones, um, uh, auxiliary equipment that, that might be used with a broadband network and a whole host of other things, um, can be guaranteed to be accessible uh, when they're brought into the country. Um, look, a, a great point, and I'm, I'm not familiar with the, the licensing requirements and how they relate to accessibility, but as part of our commitment uh, to making all services accessible, we would need to be opening up a dialogue, I would expect, with the Retailers Association and need, uh, indeed other private sector service providers on the accessibility question. So thank you for raising that. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And one more question. This is the last. Uh, but who is first? I don't know. <laughs> can anyone here help me as to who is um, first? Can I invite Sorry. people perhaps when I, because I will be placing this speech, if, if, if we provide sort of a, another channel, if you have additional yeah. questions uh, for me to forward them to me, perhaps Teresa, you could assist me with that and we'll be very happy oh, to follow up. That's wonderful, that's wonderful. So, um, I solved the problem by having two. <laughs> yes, we'll have one question, that'll be it. Um, Senator, can Sorry, I ask right. what you, um, if you would support um, Theresa Corbyn's um, call for a new Communications Act that would... Um... Yeah, um, specifically I mentioned in my speeches, that, as I'm sure you heard, if, it, we, if we require legislation to give effect to the accessibility principles under Digital First, then yes, we would do it. So it would be my pleasure to work with ACAN to look at that legislation, um, presuming and hoping... <laughs> Um, that we're in a position to do so as a government. That's wonderful. And, well, I think on that score we should give you a big clap. And thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Johanna. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great conference.